Villiers was a seaman. He was also a writer, a photographer and a filmmaker. Born in the port of Melbourne in 1903, Villiers realised that he was witness to an extraordinary event. The last days of working sail ships. He became one of the finest chroniclers of those days. And one of his most epic voyages is told here in the words of his book, with newly restored film footage. It was 1929 when Villiers and his journalist friend Ronald Walker signed on with the Grace Harbour at Wallaroo, South Australia. Villiers was an experienced seaman, but it was Walker's first voyage. Grace Harbour, built in 1889 on the Clyde, was now under the Finnish flag, being owned by Gustav Eriksson of Mariham, the last great sailing fleet in the world. They were carrying wheat, bound for Falmouth, England, it was the traditional trade for these old vessels. On the 17th of April, 1929, she set sail. Let the words of Alan Villiers tell the rest of this remarkable story. Grace Harwar is a steel full-rigged ship. She has good lines, albeit she can carry nearly 3,000 tonnes of cargo. Her three masts have a graceful loftiness. She has no other power of any kind. The crew we shipped in the old Grace Harwar was as interesting as that old timer herself. Although they were all pretty young, most of them just boys. Many of them were lads who had run away from other Finn ships because they'd found that Australia wasn't quite the land of flowing honey and so on. It was supposed to be. There we were. Twenty hands all told. Thirteen before the mast. We had chosen the Cape Horn Road because they blow down there those wild west winds and they hurry the windship along her stormy way to better latitudes. Six days out and we passed to the south of Tasmania. That was not bad going. And then came headwinds and freshening gales from south and southeast, now with nothing of west in their direction. Captain Svensson, despairing at last of weathering New Zealand and understandably fed up with the long thrash against the gale, put up the helm and squared in the yards. We steered to the north to pass through Cook Straits between the North and South Islands of New Zealand. We wanted to film the real life aboard a Cape Horn ship, a life that would stir people's blood. We had to sign before the mast and work our way to get these things. Captain Svensson, with a beard, was quite young, though he'd been in command over five years. He was 33. He'd gone to sea at the age of 10, coming from a seafaring family. The ship that Ronald Walker and Alan Villiers had chosen was the oldest of the Ericsson fleet. And she was at an age when her equipment was less reliable. Climbing aloft required skill and fitness at the best of times. On this ship, you couldn't be certain how sound your footing would be. On a square rigger, seamen had to lay out on the yards to loose or to take in sail. Stiff, wet canvas and a strong breeze. The foot ropes were their only means of support.
The helm had no wheelhouse. Several men might take the wheel in rough sea and find themselves totally exposed to winds and waves which could sweep across the deck. Villiers continues his journey. On the 29th day of May, the wind is southward, with maddening cold from the frigid hell of Antarctica. But we go coarse, not strong. But there is a Cape Horn howl in it as she rolls to windward. The boys are taking a pessimistic view of the voyage, looking forward gloomily to a seven-week run to the Horn at the very least. We were ceaselessly at the braces. The wet, stiff ropes were hard on the hands. The constant hauling on wet ropes and straining with wet, wind-stiffened canvas makes them cruelly sore, whether one has come from the office desk or pick and shovel. Working aloft, your hands are torn. Wet, strong canvas with the demon of the gale in it easily takes out the nails. You look down at your bloody hands with dumb surprise. You saw the blood streaking over the wet canvas. You looked after a while when the sail was set and saw that the tops of a finger or two of your right hand were in a mess. They didn't hurt as long as there was the exhilaration of the gale and the struggle with the sail, but afterwards... On the morning of the 38th day, Ronald Walker was killed aloft by a falling yard. It was a tragedy which Villiers never forgot, but spoke of seldom. The funeral at sea, he wrote. It was the first sea burial I have seen. I never want to be present at another. As a tribute to Walker's memory, Villiers was determined more than ever to record this terrible and extraordinary world. On the 51st day, a Cape Horn hurricane of a wind lashed the old ship. Too late to reduce canvas, the sails were blown out by the wind's ferocity. The world seemed to have gone utterly mad. The sea was running now worse than I or even the captain had ever seen it before. We hoped that she would stay before it and not broach to. It would become a famous run if only she lived through it. We were worked almost to death. Frozen, tired, sleepless, not properly fed. We had reached a state of mind in which nothing much mattered. Whatever happened to us there, we did not expect any good. Fighting for their lives, and with a leak which had to be hand-pumped during the lulls in the storm, the Grace Harwer struggled on. On the 57th day, we came round Cape Horn. God be praised. It was some time in the forenoon when we came round. I don't exactly know the hour. Nobody did. We hadn't had a sight for weeks and were running on blindly by dead reckoning. When the helmsman came in, nobody looked up. She's round, he shouted. Thank God, she's round. The pale-faced, weary boys leapt up from their bunks and cheered. It was the sole occasion on that voyage or upon any other I have made with them that I saw the Scandinavians give way to their feelings.
There was a little gin that was contributed by the captain from his slop chest supply used upon great occasions for splicing the main brace. As they sailed north into the South Atlantic, conditions remained hard, but the worst was over. It had been a bad voyage. Leaking and with a faulty chronometer, rations were also beginning to run short. The second mate, blaming himself for Ronald Walker's death, had a nervous breakdown and was confined to his bunk. And yet, the work continued, and the ship made better headway. Day after day, the northwesterly wind held with a steady strength and direction, and we sailed about 200 miles a day. We were in luck with the wind, thank heavens. We got the southeast trade on the 83rd day out somewhere in about latitude 24 degrees south, longitude 26 west. For that time of year in July, that was good. As they reached warmer latitudes, it was time to change to lighter sails. they crossed the equator, zero degrees latitude. On the day we crossed the line, there was a Neptune ceremony. Not that anyone felt like it, but to lift us out of our thoughts for a while and to give us something else to think about. We went through the complete old wind ship service. Neptune hailing the ship and coming aboard over the lightheads, proceeding in state with his court and Mrs. Neptune along the deck, asking for all those who had not previously entered his domain to be presented to him. was his wife, making up into a charming girl. Jim was the cleric, Hagberg was the barber, Bergfist the doctor, and the sailmaker, chief of police. There were two unfortunates who held no pass. They were pursued by the crew up and down the rigging with Neptune and his charming wife looking on. Arrested, smeared with a foul mixture of tar, grease and fish oil, shaved and ducked and otherwise dealt with.
conclusion of it all, they were forced to kiss Mrs. Neptune on the red lead lips. Crossing the line at 25 degrees west, the wind took them quickly over a section of the voyage where they might have expected to be becalmed. Villiers continued to film, and as the voyage became easier, he found time to record another ritual. An apprentice climbing to the truck, the very top of the mainmast. On their lonely voyage, all visitors were carefully recorded. We saw an old blue whale, which was a most friendly beast, insisting on following the ship for days, coming up lazily to blow right under the counter and close alongside. Life on deck assumed a positively domestic appearance. The first chance to wash clothes for thousands of miles and a stiff breeze to dry them in. There was time too for recreation, for hobbies to show that sail-worn hands could still do fine work. To record in a traditional way the vessel which had been home for so many months. So the Grace Harwa stood on in the North Atlantic trade winds. The master could now fix his position from the sun with his sextant. But all was still not well. The food position was then becoming a little serious. All the sugar was finished at the line. Now the margarine, never of excellent quality, was also gone. One day we made the discovery that the salt meat was all bad and that five tins of bully beef was all that remained. Becalmed 2,000 miles from home, the food situation became critical. One hundred and twenty-three days out, a passing steamer was signalled, request provisions and came to their assistance. The steamer had everything ready for us. They lowered food into the boats and threw in tobacco and newspapers. They gave us a case of milk, two cases of preserved meats, a sack of sugar, several sacks of vegetables and half the carcass of a cow. So with their strength renewed, the crew could endure what remained of the voyage, bad as it had been. For Alan Villiers, the voyage had had its share of tragedy. And yet with his writings, still photographs and cine film, he'd achieved what he and Ronald Walker had set out to do. He had captured the true flavor of life on one of the last working square riggers.
On the 130th day, we had a mere 1,000 miles more to go. It was typical of the whole voyage that we had never been bound to Queenstown. We set off for Falmouth, and that was our destination throughout the voyage. We had no idea of making for Queenstown right up to the end. The tide carried us into the harbour. Before five o'clock on the morning of September 3rd, 138 days and 11 hours out of Woolaroo, by way of Cape Horn, we came to anchor. eventually discharged her cargo in her old home port on the Clyde. She survived a few more long voyages and then was sold for breaking up in 1935. The words and images of Alan Villiers are her memorial. 